Amen, amen. Somebody to give the Lord a hand of praise this morning. For surely God is worthy to be praised from the rising of the sun unto the setting down of the same. The name of the Lord is worthy to be praised. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. For the Lord is good and his truth shall endure unto all generations. God is good on this morning. And even though it's raining on the outside, in case they didn't know it, it's raining on the inside as well. God raining down blessings to somebody, even right now. You, are, you don't even know that even as you worship and praise God, those things that you are standing in need of, God is making those things ready for you. That's why, that's why I don't know about anybody else, Deacon Campbell, but I get excited about every opportunity that I have to come into the house of God because if can't nothing else fix it, if I can just get a praise through to God, if I can just let God know much how I appreciate him through my worship, through my praise to him, can I tell you, I don't know what your Bible said, but my Bible said that God will open up the windows of heaven. I didn't say he was going to open up a car window. I didn't, I didn't say he was going to open up the door. The Bible said that God will open up the windows of heaven. And he's so good that he's going to, he's not just going to pull you out just something to get you back for the day. But he said that I'll pour out a blessing that you won't even have room enough to receive. In other words, I'm going to bless you in such a way that you can't keep it to yourself. Man, get you something to say. You, you get you something to say. That's the kind of God that we serve. If you trust in him and you put your faith in him, God will do some things in your life. I trust you that. So good to see all of you that are here on this morning. As always, we're thankful for those that are watching us via live stream this morning. Glad that out of all the places that you could have stopped by this morning, that you chose to stop by and be here with us this morning. I was over there watching myself because I'm in three places right now. I'm in... I'm here before y'all, but I'm also in Harlem, New York right now, and I'm also in Tulsa, Oklahoma, as we're standing right here. Um, so so uh, if you're watching me here, thank you, but you know, go check out, check out the other stuff too, amen. Um, so I want to encourage you all, this week I'm doing a um, revival for the Harlem Church of Christ. Um, that'll be live stream. Um, it's live, you can't watch it right now because you're here. Um, but uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday will be 7.30 each night. So I want to um, encourage you all, Facebook Live, and uh, I'll be sharing it from my page as well as our page. So you'll be able to go in there and uh, check that out. And we also want to take this time to encourage you all that have not as of yet attended Wednesday Night Bible class. We want to encourage you to come out and attend Wednesday Night Bible class. Y'all ain't having a good time on Wednesday night. We're having a good time on Wednesday night. We're having a good time, so we want to encourage you, if you can, to come out um, and be a part of that, that it may be a blessing um, to your life. Um, now, uh, anybody come to hear a word from the Lord this morning? Amen. That was half of y'all. Anybody come to hear a word from the Lord this morning? Amen. I believe we came to the right place. Let us go, let us go to the book of Genesis, first book in the Bible, Genesis, chapter number 22, verses 1 and 2. I'll make you a deal today. If you let me know that you're hearing what I'm saying, I might let you get out of here early. How about that? Amen. That, that, look, that means that, that mean I don't have to say, let me get an amen. That means before I can say it, okay, that, see, y'all already, see, y'all y'all know, y'all know what to do. Amen. Genesis chapter 22. Verses 1. <laughs> verses 1 and 2. And the Bible says, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Take your son, he said, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I'm going to tell you about. Pray with me if you will. Father in heaven, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that you have blessed us with, that we may come and feast at the table of your word. Father, I pray that we have come as empty pitchers before a flowing fountain, and that we'll receive just that which we came for. Father, now I ask that you would bless your servant, decrease me that you might increase, hide me behind your cross, make my words so feeble in human wisdom that they can only be seen by the shadow of the cross. And if you grant us these petitions and prayers, we'll be so ever mindful to give your name, the praise, the glory, and the honor of which you are so worthy of. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let us all say amen. 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 Just look over at somebody this morning and say, it's just a test. 
Whatever you're up against, whatever you're going through, is just, just a test. We don't sing it really, but there's a song that you once heard that said, I'm so glad that trouble don't last always. Ain't you thankful for that? Thank God for that. That even though I may be in a storm right now, sooner or later the storm is going to pass over. And all of us that are here this morning are either coming out of a test, headed towards a test, or somebody can say, preacher, I'm being tested even right now. But the good news is, it's only a test. It's just a test. Abraham, whose name means exalted father in chapter 17, in chapter 22, he's called Abraham the father of many nations. For 25 years, Abraham and Sarah have trusted in God's promise. There's an interlude between the promise and its fulfillment. So Abraham and Sarah, like us sometimes, they ran ahead of God to help God facilitate his plans. And Sarah, you remember she advises Abraham that if you're going to have a son, you need to go ahead and do it now. Because you know you're getting old, we're not going to be able to make anything happen. Do it now with my handmaid, my servant, Hagar. And you know, Abraham, he goes along with the scheme and Ishmael is born, but Ishmael is not God's promised child. Ishmael was not the promise that God had made to Abram and Sarah. And Abram, at the time that he had Ishmael, he, when God made him the promise, he was 75 years old when God made him the promise that he was going to be the father of many nations. Now, we would have had some questions. We, we would have had some inquiries on our mind. Lord, I'm 75 years old. And you're coming to tell, I ain't even got a child, and yet you're telling me that I'm going to be the father of many nations? Now, I, 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 I don't know you to be a God that tells anything but the truth, but I'm having just a, a little bit of difficulty understanding and believing what you're trying to tell me right now. And God did not fulfill the promise when he was 75 years old, but rather God waited until this man was 99 years old. And he waited until his wife was 90 years old before he fulfilled the promise. Any type of desire that they had had been extinguished between Abraham and Sarah. And God announces that she gonna get pregnant. And Sarah reasonably laughs. <laughs> but I, you know, anybody would have got a good kick out of that, I mean. You telling me, old as I am, look at me, that I'm going to have a child. God says, why is Sarah laughing? Is there anything too hard for God? And isn't that just like God, y'all? He waits until every opportunity for our assistance has been depleted. Then he shows up and does what could not be done in the first place unless he intervened and gave us his assistance. And Abraham has this bouncing baby boy that he loves and he cherishes Isaac. And Isaac is his only son. Now Ishmael is a son, but he's not the son of promise. Ishmael is a son born out of a scheme, but Isaac is born out of God's plan. And he is the son of promise. He is the son of prophecy. And he is the son of Abraham's old age. And God one day calls Abraham to bring him up to Mount Moriah to kill him. To sacrifice him on an altar. That request of God is God. Isaac was dead before he left home. Because Abraham... Did not ask God any questions. Abraham did not say, well, Lord, can you do it? Lord, he didn't ask any questions. He simply did what it was that God had told him to do. Can I tell you, child of God, if God has instructed you to do something, you don't need to ask no questions. This ain't Jeopardy. This ain't, this ain't 21 questions. You don't need to question God. Ask God how he's going to do it. Ask God when he's going to do it. Ask God by what means he's going to do it. You just need to have faith and to walk and to trust God and believe him that if he called me out here, then surely he got somewhere that he want me 
to go. If he called me to this, then surely he's given me everything that I need to make sure that it happens and that it comes to pass. He determined to do what God had told him to do. And somebody here, the only way you can do the impossible is to believe God. That's the only way you're going to be able to do it. You cannot do it in and of yourself. You are going to have to rely on the power of God and the word of God. God's word is true, church. God's word is powerful. And when you can't stand on anything else, you can stand on the word of God. I don't know about y'all, but I got me some scriptures filed away for every circumstance that I go through in this life. If I'm troubled, I got a scripture that I can run to and find some consolation. If I'm sick in my body, I got some scripture that I can run to and find myself some consolation. If I need some peace and some understanding, I can go to the word of God and I can find a scripture that can give me something that's going help me in my time of need it's impossible for Moses to stretch his rod and open the Red Sea unless God was with him it's, it, it's, it's impossible for these things to happen it's impossible for Gideon to start off with 32,000 and end up with 300 and win a war it ain't possible Unless God has something, it's impossible for David to take a slingshot and to kill a nine feet tall, 450 pound beast. That's impossible. That causes us logically not to believe it unless you put God in it. And when God is in it, the Red Sea opens. When God is in it, Jericho's walls come falling down. I wish I had a witness here this morning. There was no one. When God is in it, David slays Goliath. When God is in it, Gideon routs the Midianites because God is in it. And when God is in it, that makes the difference. Lord, we've been fishing all night long and we ain't caught nothing. What was the difference? Last night, Jesus wasn't on the boat. But today, Jesus is on the boat. Jesus wasn't on the boat last night. You didn't catch anything. But today, Jesus is on the boat. And you done caught so much that you got to call other folk to come and get some of the fish. Because it's so much. Too often, we approach this story as if God is on the bench. As if God is the one that's on trial. But it's not God's character that is in question. It's Abraham's character that is on the stand. Now, if you grew up, I, I wasn't here, but if you grew up between 1963 and 1967, you heard this message more than once. This is a test. For the next 60 seconds, this station will conduct a test for the American broadcast system. The announcer would say, this is only a test. And then this kind of annoying, unnerving sound would come on the television. And especially for y'all, somebody say amen if you came up in the 60s and the 70s, because y'all only had three television stations. Come on, somebody. You had ABC, you had NBC, and CBS. Come on, somebody. That's all you had. There's somebody here old enough to admit that said, Preacher, I can remember when I ain't had a choice but a three children. <laughs> and then you had to get you some aluminum foil and put it on your antenna and, and turn it down. And some of y'all, they had the satellite outside where you, know, a little son, you had to go outside, you had to turn that thing a certain direction so you can get you a good signal. You ain't always had a 40 in the 50. And some of y'all know what a fat back is. Channel 3, Channel 10, and Channel 11. <laughs> and whenever the announcer calls, the announcer said, if this were an actual emergency, you would be instructed. I need to tell somebody in the church today that this is only a test. And if you would try, and if it was really an emergency, don't you believe that your father God would show up on your behalf and do those things that you are in need of? 
God is not going to show up and do what he's given you the ability to do. God is not going to intervene and change anything that he's given you the ability to change. But when it gets out of your realm, when it gets out of your strength, when it gets out of your ability, that's when God will step right smack dab in the middle of your situation and say, I am here. I am Jesus. I am on the scene. I am here to do something about your situation. Now, God tests us for two primary reasons. The first is that it is an opportunity for God to prove himself to us. And secondly, it's an opportunity for us to prove ourselves to God. I want to press this to somebody's heart this morning. God will go after anything you trust in more than him. Until you put it on the altar, God will go after anything that you trust in more than you trust him. You got to put your marriage on the altar. You got to put your son on the altar. You got to put your family on the altar. You got to put your money on the altar. You got to put your health on the altar. You got to put your desires on the altar. You got to put whatever you want on the altar because if what you want and what you have is more important than God, God know how to get it out the way. If the gift ever becomes more than the gift giver then the very thing God gave you to serve his purposes is undermining his plan for your life if the gift ever becomes more important than the gift giver then the very thing that God gave you to serve his purposes is now getting in the way let me explain this a little better Lucifer we've been talking about on Wednesday night who became Satan was the bright sun of the morning God made him beautiful. He was the most beautiful. God gave him that beautiful voice that he had. God made him the son of the morning. Lucifer, before he came, Satan led the singing up there in heaven. God made him the most beautiful and gave him the most beautiful voice. And Lucifer was the bright son of the morning until he looked in the mirror. And he thought that what he had belonged to him. And he put himself above the one who called him and gave him the gift. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, the lesson of Lucifer's fall is simply this. Whatever you don't turn into praise turns into pride. I don't care what it is. Whatever you don't turn into praise, it's going to turn into pride. If God gave it to you, you ought to praise God for it. Or else you'll get proud because of it. And the very thing God called and gave for you to serve him, that thing will start using you to undermine what God has called you to do. And when you are possessed by your possessions, I said when you are possessed by your possessions, your prize becomes pride and God will fire you. And church, it's an awful thing for God to fire you and you keep coming to work. It's a bad thing. It's a bad thing for God to fire you. And you keep showing up for work. You just keep coming to work, not even knowing what has happened. And, and, and it's an awful thing. God took his spirit from Samson. And he didn't even know it. The more God blesses you, the harder it is to keep those blessings from becoming idols in your life. The more God blesses you, the harder it is to keep those blessings from becoming idols. I don't want anything in my life that's too much for me to give up for God. I say I don't want anything. I don't want anything in my life that's too much for me to give up for God. Because if you can't give it up, God is coming after it because God doesn't want the blessing in your life. My Bible says that God is a jealous God. And he said that he'll have no other God before him. Do you know that you can, have, you can have so much faith and so much love for stuff? Whatever it is that got all of your time, your attention, your love, and your devotion, what is that? Your God. A job can be your God. A vehicle can be your God. Your house 
can be your God. Whatever it is that you have in front of him, that's the problem. Shouldn't that be in front of him? Everything ought to come behind him. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added. They shall be added unto you. I want you to see in this text that Abraham, even though he was the saint of God, he was the father of a faithful. Abraham had no notion, church, of how God, you see, if you was at home with your grandma right then, she'd tell you, get somewhere and sit down, go out talk. <laughs> I want you to see, I want you to see, Abraham had no notion of how God was going to turn that thing around. God just said, get up, take your only son, your uniquely born son, bring him up to the mountain that I'm going to show you. And without question, Abraham got up, took God at his word, and told Isaac, come with me. He said, on his way to make a great sacrifice, he was going to give up the thing that he had waited 99 years just to receive. I want to know, what are you willing to give up this morning? What are you willing to give up? Can God, can, God can never give back to you what you're not ready to give up in the first place. So many of us, we want to give up certain things in our lives, but we don't want to give up other things in our life. And can I tell you, God does not just want part of your life, but God wants all of your life. God does not just want to inhabit certain areas of your life, but God wants to inhabit all areas of your life. God don't just want to be able to come in the best of you. God want to be able to sit in your living room. God don't just want to be able to come in your living room. God want to be able to come and sit at your kitchen table. God don't just want to be able to sit at your kitchen table. He want to be able to ride out with you in the car. God wants to have every area of your life. He wants to consume every area of your life. So Abraham, without question, God tells him, get up and take your son and go to a place that I'm going to show you. That, that, that's the thing. God, if you would have told me to go and then gave me a road map, it would have been a different story. But God just said, get up and go to a mountain that I'm going to show you. Go sacrifice your, your son, your child. Can, can you just look at that and see the level of faith that this man must have had first of all you called me when I was still at my daddy's house told me to leave my father's house when I was still out there in Ur of the Chaldees and told me to go and you didn't even give me a road map then what's up with this you telling me to go somewhere you're not giving me direction you're telling me to go somewhere you're not telling me exactly where I'm going can I tell you that's what faith is all about Faith is the substance of things that we hope for and it is the evidence of things that we cannot see. I wonder when we're really going to learn how to walk with God by faith. Lord, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm still going to walk with you. Lord, I don't know where the road is going to end up, but I'm still going to walk with you because I trust you enough to know that you would not have just brought me out here to leave me desolate and alone and by myself, but whether you've already promised me in your word that you will be with me always even unto the end of the earth so we have to sell out every part of our life let God have access to every part of your life come to God and give God everything that's our problem Lord I won't, I'll let you handle these situations but then I got some stuff, you know, they, they just said it wrong. So, you know, I, I got to go back and I got to get them for myself. Lord, I ain't going to let you deal with that. I'm, I'm going to get that part. Whatever it is that you have in your life, you give it over to God and you let God handle that situation. Because the battle ain't even yours anyway. But the battle belongs to the Lord. How does he do it? Abraham on the mountain, he takes the knife. And just envision that in your mind. He's actually ready to take the knife and come down and take the life and actually kill his only son. And when God saw the faith of Abraham, because the test is not just to prove Abraham, but for Abraham to prove God. And God can't demonstrate his faithfulness until you exercise your faith. 
You got to first of all put your faith in, amen, like, but you got to first of all put your faith in action. See, you're waiting for God to do something faithful, but you haven't exercised your faith in the first place. You haven't done anything that's God's side. When you do little stuff that you can do, God ain't going to get in that. But when you do stuff that can't nobody do but God, he will show up and let you know that I've been waiting on you. I've been waiting on somebody to step out on faith. So I can show you just what kind of God I am, just what kind of power I actually have. Do you not know, church, that we serve a God that is able to do exceeding and abundant above all that we could ever ask or think? You think God having trouble with doing the little bit of stuff in your life just because he ain't showed up just yet, just because he ain't did it right now. God got a time, God got a place for everything in his life. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait on the Lord. Tell somebody on my way. Abraham was about to kill Isaac. And God says to Abraham, now I know. Now I know that you trust me. Now, now I know that you have faith. Your faith has been vindicated. Your faith has been vindicated. Now, now since I know that you got faith. Turn around. Look over there in the bush. There's a ram. Somebody just missed their whole. That's how, look over there in a, because you stretched your faith. Because you trusted me. Even when you didn't know what a circumstance was going to end up. You were willing to follow me to the point of taking the life of your only child that you waited 99 years for. But now that I see that you're going to trust me by faith. Look over there in the bush. There's a ram caught up in the thinking. Listen, what's going on on one side and what's going on on the other side? On the other side of this mountain, he was coming up. Man, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, son, if you're going to come back down with me. I don't know. Could you imagine how he was coming back down? I don't know about Abraham, but I would have just been praising God. I would have just been thanking God because not knowing the mindset that I had going up, now I know that God is not just a God that wants to take something from me, but God is a God that wants to prove my faith so he can do something even more in my life. The ram could only be provided when Abraham needed it. God would not show up, church, until the situation is past your help. Until the situation is past your sister. You can't do anything about it. You can't handle it anymore. Then God shows up and does what only God can do. Abraham had his son. But I want you to know that the ram in the thicket represents for us a great substitute. Yeah. Hear me when I say God will not allow Abraham to do on Mount Moriah what Jesus was going to do on Calvary. Come on. Come on. I said God was not going to allow Abraham to do what Jesus was going to do on Calvary. Then one day, you remember because one Friday on a skull-shaped hill, God gave up his only son. God would not let Abraham get glory that would only should be due to him. And because Isaac and the ram caught up in the thicket for us represents a type or a picture of Christ. But the real substitute was coming down 42 long generation, born in Bethlehem of Judea to a peasant girl by the name of Mary and a carpenter by the name of Joseph. He was born in Bethlehem, reared and raised in Nazareth, baptized, come on somebody, in the Jordan River, performed miracles in the desert place, healed the sick, gave sight to the blind, made the lame man walk, made the deaf man heal again, went to Peter's house and raised his mother-in-law from the dead. Jairus' daughter was at the point of death. Jesus laid his hands on her and the girl was brought back to death. The woman with the issue of blood said if I could just touch the heel of his garment and she was made whole. Jesus was on his way to the cross because he is the ram caught in the thicket. Come on, 
He is our rest. He is our Passover land. He is our sacrifice. And when he went to the cross of Calvary, and here is the center of our gospel. He died for the sins of the whole wide world. Red, yellow, black and white, what is up? We're all precious in his sight. He died for everybody. God didn't just die for the black man. He didn't just die for the white man. He didn't just die for somebody that got money, somebody that's poor. He died for everybody. He said there's no more Jew, no Greek, no more born, no more free, no more male or female, for we are now all one. In Christ, he made that possible for us because he was our sacrifice, because he was our ram caught in the thicket. And can I tell you, any sin that you could ever name, the blood has the power to cover. Any sin, any sin that you can name, any deed that you can call out, the blood of that lamb has the power to cover. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Singing, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. It is not by the blood of bulls and goats and of rams that we are saved. We are saved by the blood of Jesus. And even those in the Old Testament that offered bulls, that offered goats, that offered rams, that was not for the cleansing of their sins or for their salvation. It was a type, a foreshadowing of what was to come. And I'm glad. That he didn't let Abraham do what Jesus was going to eventually do. I'm glad. I'm glad that he didn't allow him to do something. Because here it is. At the end of the day, God's going to get his glory. At the end of the day, he's going to get the glory that is due to him. And I'm not going to let somebody else stand in the light that I'm supposed to stand in. He died. Didn't he die? But he got up from the grave. With all power in his hand. We were Abraham and Isaac. We needed a scapegoat. We needed a sacrifice. We needed somebody to go in our place. And Jesus did that. You couldn't stand for yourself. So he stood for you. You didn't have a defender that was good enough. So he defended your case. He paid a debt he did not owe. Because you owed a debt that you could not pay. He took on himself the sins of the whole wide world. And that is why he was on the cross of Calvary. And he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because when he looked up into heaven, God turned his back on him. Why did God turn his back on him? Because when God looked at the cross, he didn't see Jesus. He saw your sin. He saw our hangups. He saw our troubles. He saw the things that we had put on him. And he died. For the sins of the entire world. He was our ram. Caught in the bush. He was our ram. Caught in the thicket. Abraham. A man of faith. The first man to ever walk with God by faith. Abraham. Lord, Lord. Well, I've waited 99 years. Let's think about that. 99 years. You have waited for something. And God finally gives it to you. And not long after you've gotten it, he wants to take it away. But I believe Abraham was able to have that kind of faith, Elder, because he recognized the child wasn't really his. God gave it to him. God gave them that blessing. 
And as I already said, you should never allow the gift to become more important than the gift giver. You should never allow what God has given you to become more important in your life than the God that first of all gave it to you. Because can I tell you, the same way that God gave it, he know how to take it away. If God bless you with something and you let that something overshadow him in your life and take up presence in your life, God knows exactly how to draw that thing out of your life. Somebody let money get in front of God. God knows how to cut holes in your pockets. He knows how to cut holes in the bottom of your back. Everywhere you go, stuff that I got to pay for this, got to pay for that, got to pay for this, got to pay for that. Always putting out, always putting out. And after a while, you turn around and you ain't got two pennies to rub together. Because you put more faith in what God gave you than you had in the God that gave. And God got to show you, okay, I was God before you ever got that. And I want to show you that I'm going to be God even after I take it away. I don't know about y'all, but I've had God to take some things away from me. And I've had God to remove some things, some people out of my life. And at that moment, I did not understand. At that moment, I kind of, you know, didn't really understand what God was doing and why he was doing it. But can I tell you, God knows what you need in your life, who you need in your life, when you need them in your life. And can I tell you, a lot of us, even right now, are holding on to stuff that God been trying to pull away, God been trying to cut away, God been trying to snatch away for years now, and we still holding on to it. You need to let that stuff go. Because if there's anything in your life that comes before God, it's in the wrong place. So even to the point of being able to give up his own child. That's faith. Oh, yeah. To the point of being able to offer up and sacrifice the promise that God had made him. Not knowing that it was just a test. Not knowing that I, I'm not really going to do what you think I'm going to do. I'm just going to let you believe it until I see that you really trust me. And look over there in the bush. There's a ram caught in the thicket. And I'm glad that Jesus did not leave us out here to say, you know what? I'm going to let y'all handle it for yourself. I'm going to let you fend for yourself. You got yourself into that trouble. You find a way to get yourself out of it. But Jesus is our ram in the bush. And can I tell you, I don't know about y'all, but I find him having to be my ram every day of my life. It seemed like some way, shape, form, or fashion, the devil got you hemmed in, the devil got you cornered, and you got to find some way to get out, and Jesus steps in, and he is our ram in the bush. He makes a way for us to escape so we don't have to go through it. I'm thankful for that. Can I tell you, there are some things, even right now, you wouldn't have to go through it. If you just realize that your lamb has already taken it, take your burdens to the Lord Amen. and leave them there. Stop worrying about it. Stop fretting about it. Give that thing over to God. Let him handle it. You thinking this is it and God, you don't even know it's just a test. You thinking it's too much for you and God said this ain't, this ain't nothing but a test. Had you been taking notes all the while you was in class, you'd be ready for this test. I got a teacher in the house. I, I, I don't know of anybody that can sit in your class, ain't heard none of the material before in their life, don't know nothing that's coming out of your mouth, and they just going to make a 100 on the test. I don't, I don't, unless God has just favored them like that. I don't know anybody that's just going to come in there and ace everything that you give them unless they take time to write down the material, to take notes, to go back in their own personal time, review and study the material so when it's test time, I'll be ready. That's the same thing we got to do, church. We got to study our notes. We got to study the book. God has given you everything that you need, but the only way you're going to know what's in it. Let me show because a lot of people don't know this. Let me show you. Watch this. Watch, watch that. Look, that's so simple. Watch, look, watch. A 
Amazing, right? Amazing. If we just take time and open it up. The words of life. Whatever we're dealing with. You struggling with your faith? God got an answer. Well, for God at sundry times and in divers matters, spake unto us by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his, through his son, Jesus Christ. And since he's no longer here, he gave us everything that we need. So we ain't got no excuse because he gave us everything that we need. And what, 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 that, that ain't all of it. I, I know. Many other things did Jesus in the midst of his disciples, but they are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe. Open it up. Study it in your own personal time. So when you are tested, because can I tell you, you're going to be tested. That weren't proper English. You are going to experience testing. You are going to go through tests. And you're going to have to have, you're going to need to know God's word so you can stand even during those times. Put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand. We talked about that on Wednesday night against the wiles of the devil. The devil is so organized that he ain't got just one wild that he's throwing at you. He got wiles. He got many different things that he's throwing at Many different tests that we are going to experience in this life. But you can pass all of them as long as you stand on God's word. My brother and my sister, God's word is true. God's word is sure. Paul said that the gospel is God's power to save individuals. And that is so true even of today. The word of God, even after this world, even of itself, has passed and done away with. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will stand forever. It is this word that will judge us in the last day. So I would think it would be a good thing if we become acquainted with it on this side because it's the same thing that's going to judge us one day on the other side. So we need to prepare ourselves for the test that are coming in this life. My brother, my sister, my friend, maybe you're here today. Preacher, I'm experiencing tests even right now in my life. Experience tests on my job, family life. You know, you're not just tested in one area of the life. You're tested in all areas of your life. All areas of your life. In every area of your life, you have an opportunity to show whether or not you are really going to be a person of faith or whether or not your faith is going to waver. James says something, he said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who give it to all men liberally and upbraid it not. Here's the key. But let him ask in faith. Yeah, in faith. Nothing wavering. Your faith ought not doubt. Your faith ought not be conflicted within itself. But your faith ought to be whole. Surely trusting in the word of God. Because I, I know, I know, I don't have to take a tally, I don't have to take a poll. I know there are about however many in here, that's all many have history with God. This ain't the first time you've been through a test. This ain't the first time you ever needed God to show up. Come on now. And this ain't the first time that God has ever showed you that he's still in the miracle working business. So let your faith rest on what God has already done. Have reassurance in what he's doing even right now. And looking forward by faith and in hope of all those things that God is going to do down the road. For eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it even entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. My brother, my sister, maybe, maybe you're here today, even of yourself, you're experiencing testing, going through a tough time, experiencing a rough patch in your life, and you're standing in the need of prayer this morning. Allow us to pray for you. Maybe you're watching us this morning. You're experiencing difficulty you're going through tests it, as i've already said it's, it's going to hit all of us if you're not going through one right now haven't just came out of one a test is surely on the way the best way is to prepare yourself so when the time comes you'll be ready to pass the test my brother my sister maybe you're watching maybe you're here this morning and you are not yet a christian you have not yet had your sins washed away by the blood of the lamb you come back here in his word 
believing the same, repenting of your sins, confessing Christ as your Savior. Be buried with him in baptism. Have your sins washed away, done away with, never to come before you in this life, neither the life that is to come. And the Lord himself will add you to his body. If you're subject to the invitation, I beckon, I plead, why not come to Jesus now? Together we stand and sing the song of invitation.